Uh, don't check your stocks too much. Don't check the news. I mean, they have to put something out on the TV to, to entertain you, to keep you watching. It's an attention game, right? That's their business, but that's not an investing and that's not what investors should do. Companies like Walmart, like Amazon, like, like Disney, these companies have done better than their peers for long, long, long times. That's rare and that tends to be underpriced in financial models in my experience. There were 900 e-commerce companies in the 1990s. And, and at least a couple of years ago, I think there are 40,000 different crypto coins. And I don't know what the number there are now, but that's the way things work. There's a whole mm. bunch in the beginning and then almost all of them die, leaving just a handful. Well, I just want to give a quick word from my friends and sponsors at Vodafone Business. Uh, I used to think of Vodafone Business as only a reliable provider of mobile and broadband needs, but they're really stepping up to help Irish businesses grow and flourish in an increasingly digital world. So they now offer a whole array of digital apps from productivity tools and security solutions to IT support and even website builders. More recently, Vodafone have launched their VHub digital advisory service. With its new service, Irish businesses of all sizes can get free one-to-one -one digital support and advice tailored to their business by simply booking a call with one of the VHub digital experts on the Vodafone business website. Search Vodafone VHub for more information. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and stock investors around the world. I'm delighted to be joined today by James Early, a name that will be familiar to anyone of my generation who has self-directed their stock investments from the outset. James is the Chief Investment Officer at BBAE, a digital investment platform. In the past, he has worked for or advised many of the largest companies in the investment research industry around the world, such as MarketWise, uh, the UK subsidiary of Agora, Investopedia, and very many more. But notably, it was his role at The Motley Fool where I tuned in. James served as The Fool's first director of research and analysis and was the lead advisor to its Motley Fool income investor advisory product for 10 years outperforming the S&P 500 every one of those 10 years. He established or helped establish the Fool UK's equity advisory business, and he was a founding commentator of the Motley Fool Money, which we all know about here, uh, which for a time, as a lot of our listeners know, was the number one business podcast on iTunes. James, you're very welcome. Emmett, thank you. That is the kindest intro I've ever received. And it, it, I'm listening saying, who is that person? It doesn't seem to be me, but, but I appreciate that. No, there's no imposter syndrome allowed around here. <laughs> James, speaking of being complimentary, I noticed that you're a Mensa member. So straight off the bat, I want to ask you, is there a correlation between intelligence and successful investing? I, I think so, Emmett. I think there's probably an inverse correlation. Uh, once you get too far above the median, right? It's so easy in investing to to think you're smarter than you are or to assume that it's a game of intelligence. But economics is a social science. It's not a deterministic science like physics. You know, you touch a cactus, it's prickly. You touch a second cactus, it's prickly. You see a third cactus, you know, it's probably going to be prickly. That's how our brains are wired. We think there's a correlation between how much effort we put in or how confident somebody is and how competent they are. In a social science, there's not, or at least there's much, much less. Whereas in a caveman world, the guy who's confident about where the water source is or where the game migration path is, is probably right. It's totally yeah. flipped in investing. So intelligence is more likely to be a trap that pulls you away. Uh, the market is away from good returns, I should say. The market is almost sm always smarter than you, but the market is almost never less patient than you. Yeah. So it, what you're saying is IQ is one thing, but EQ is probably where you can win the race. Yeah, for sure. For sure. In 2021, the uh, more money went into the stock market, at least in the US, than in the prior 19 years combined. But that was wow. the very worst time for money to be going into the market. So yes, it's far more about emotional intelligence, about, about managing your own emotions, really. Uh, you kind of have to be beady-eyed. Like if you look at people like Warren Buffett, and I know I'm stereotyping, but investing is a game for people with a cool, calm demeanor, people who don't get emotional, people who can understand the long term effects of compounding. Compounding is extremely powerful, but it's also extremely non-intuitive, at least for, for many people. But that's what investing is all about, being able to see, OK, this company is just a little bit better right now than the peers. But that one percent edge compounded over three years, five years, seven years, 10 years, whatever, is going to make a huge difference in my my returns. Like people who can see that people who can 
kind of quell the emotion, uh, calm down the storm, do well in investing. And if you can't, if you can't, that's okay. You just need to idiot proof yourself. You need to buy. I have a lot of ETFs, very boring style of investing. Just buy stuff, sit there and hold it. Uh, don't check your stocks too much. Don't check the news. I mean, they have to put something out on the TV to, to entertain you, to keep you watching. It's an attention game, right? That's their business, but that's not an investing and that's not what investors should do. Yeah, good point. I mean, so while we're kind of talking about philosophy and non-specifics, can you dive in for a moment and just describe your investment philosophy? You touched on ETFs there, but if you were to write your own uh, one paragraph investing autobiography, what would it say? I almost think Emmett, that, that someone's investing philosophy, at least for a, a fundamental based investor like me, should be too boring to fit into a good media soundbite, but I'm gonna try <laughs> anyway. So you're, you're always trying to exploit the cognitive weaknesses of other people in investing. And that sounds bad or it sounds kind of predatory, but they're trying to do the same thing to you. They just don't realize it. In other words, markets are basically broadly efficient. And that's good because if you had some great idea that never came to pass in terms of the market coming to recognize it. You know, if you knew the Hope Diamond was buried under some company's headquarters, but there's never going to be a catalyst to find it, then it wouldn't make sense to buy that company. So you want markets to be efficient, but not always. And, you're and, and, and the way you do that, the way you exploit that is just by, by saying, okay, people can be smarter than me, but I'm not going to try to play that. I'm not going to try to play that game, excuse me, or I can be more patient. So patience is the game for me, for, for I think anyone who's, who's going to outperform in the long term. I enact that by buying mostly ETFs, low cost, mm -hmm. boring ETFs. This is the unsexy part. Now, the more exciting part, when I buy stocks beyond that, I have a reason. I always have a reason for buying a stock. Like, is it going to beat the S&P 500 or not? Because I'm an American, so that's the index I compare to. Uh, if not, I'll just put more money in SPY or some index fund, right? Um, I look for no thesis stocks. I don't want to have a lot of contingencies that have to go right for my for my portfolio to do well, for my company to 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 make money. I want to see companies who have done the same thing over and over and they can just wash, rinse, repeat year after year. Uh, I want to find stocks that don't mean revert. In other words, most uh, most companies tend to do well for a little bit if they do well and then collapse to the mean and, and sometimes just disappear altogether. But if you look at companies like Walmart, like Amazon, like like Disney, Disney, not right now is, is not a good example, but traditionally Disney, these companies have done better than their peers for long, long, long times. That's that's rare. And that tends to be underpriced in in financial models, in my experience. Uh, and then finally, I will say I look for the occasional biotech or, you know, whatever aggressive play. If I think I've got a really strong thesis, but that's the icing on the cake. Those are small positions. Sometimes they do well, sometimes they don't. So mm -hmm. mostly ETFs, that's the biggest block in my food pyramid. Then no thesis stocks and then the occasional, uh, you know, sexy position. So when I take what you've said, James, and think about the service that you ran for 10 years so successfully, which was concerned with dividend investing, I think of dividend investing as the close relation of ETF investing. You're looking for these businesses that have reliable characteristics that are throwing off cash. Can you talk to me a little bit about dividend investing and if it still forms part of your philosophy? Ah, oh, close parallel to ETF. And you're very wise, Emmett. I think I've never heard that <laughs> observation, but 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 I like it. I'm gonna have to ponder that. Um, okay, so, so like, you're, sorry, your question was I was just so enamored with that. Like, what works in dividends and 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 maybe well, what yeah, I suppose let let's dive into dividend investing for a moment because I think a lot of our listeners would be more orientated towards growth investing. That's certainly mm -hmm. my investment style. And I would say that that's how I've tilted the table for the conversations that I've engaged in. But could you talk to me a little bit about dividend investing? Specifically, what is it that you look for in a great dividend paying business? And then the inverse as well. What is it that's a red flag to you when it comes to spotting a business that's paying what appears to be a regular dividend. Sure, sure. And it's understandable, by the way, that, that people would focus on growth investing uh, over the past 13, 14 years, right? Because we've had extremely low interest rates. Uh, we've had a, the, the best time probably in all of our lifetimes for, for growth investing. Because when, when, low rate, when rates are low, that pushes up, relatively speaking, the, the long-term uh, value of, of the cash flows that come far into the future. So if I have a biotech that's not going to make money for five years, for 10 years into the future, those cash flows that I project are worth relatively more under a low interest rate scenario. In fact, a lot more, not just relatively, like much, much more versus you know the, the here and now cash flows. That has flipped. We have uh, much higher rates now. They may come down, but much higher rates, which has put a premium on here and now cash flows like dividend stocks. Now, of course, bonds 
bonds emit compete with dividend stocks for for yield, but I still think overall kind of the, the, the tried and true bread and butter nature of dividend stocks is, is going to make them more sexy for a while. So that's my, my preamble. In terms of what I look for, what I don't look for, uh, I would say, so, so a dividend is a preference. You don't have to invest in dividends, but but you choose to. And there are companies that choose to exploit that preference. I would call them dividend imposters. They say, hmm, you know, now's a great time to be a dividend stock because everybody seems to be liking dividend stocks. So we're like maybe kind of sort of a dividend stock or not really fully a dividend stock. We pay a little bit of a dividend, but it's not that much. So let's see how we can look better. Let's try to pay more, uh, either squeezing our cash flows or even worse, borrowing money to pay the dividend. That's like, you know, the most heinous thing you can do. Yeah, because it's pure it's and sustainable. Yeah, you know, and they do it. They do it because they know that some people say, okay, I want to open up my stock screener on whatever, you know, tab uh, and, 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 and search for dividends about 3%, right? And this one looks good, I'll buy it. Uh, so, you know, so they're trying to catch the, the people who aren't really paying attention and it, it works sometimes. So don't fall for that. Watch the payout ratio, just comparing dividends uh, paid to net income. Um, you know, there are different ways to do it. Uh, you know, for, for certain other companies, you might look at distributed cash flow compared to cash flow available for distribution, but I'm, I'm getting more nuanced. And if you're looking at a company like a master limited partnership, you should know this already. Uh, for positives, what to look for in good dividend companies, I would say I look for what I call the three M's, management, moat, and money situation. Now, these could apply to any company really, but I think they especially fit dividends. A management, obviously, you want to see people who have been at least in the industry for a while, ideally with the company for a while, but at least in the industry. And you know that's normally the case with, with dividend companies. Sometimes with, with tech startups, it's not. Um, moat is kind of the most important thing. I measure moat by a high and sustained return on invested capital. ROIC. You could Google that metric if you'd like to learn more. But broadly speaking, the, the quick summary is if you it's sort of like uh, money available to pay the capital providers of a business compared to how much capital those providers have put in. If Emmett and James each put in a certain amount of money, uh, we're expecting a certain return. Well, what's the return available to Emmett and James in that business? That's sort of ROIC. It's sort of like a, a bigger version of return on equity, which is Warren Buffett's favorite metric. It includes debt, whereas return on equity just includes equity. So moat, uh, that second one, Measured by ROIC, you could also look at things like ROE and then money situation. Obviously, if you have a dividend paying company, you want to make sure it can pay its dividend. And I'm, I look at the I mean, first of all, just to, to back up with, with money situation, if I'm spending a lot of time in it on on analyzing whether or not a company can pay its dividend, that is a yellow flag, probably a red flag to me already that I should move on. And yeah. I don't want a company that's barely kind of maybe paying its dividend. But, you know, sometimes with, with a new company, you have to measure and say, OK, how sustainable is this dividend? Maybe the payout ratio looks good for the moment, but in you know a couple of years, uh, things may change. So but, but that should be something quick. You should not be spending a lot of time on that one if you're really looking for a solid dividend. Hello, everyone. I'd like to take one minute to tell you about a brand new My Wall Street service called Nexus and to invite you to register your interest so you can be the first to hear about it when it launches in November. As you know, AI is changing all businesses and those who do not embrace it risk being left behind. The product we've created fuses state-of-the-art AI, advanced filtering, and the intelligence of master investors for short, actionable insights. There are over 58,000 listed companies on 60 exchanges around the world from which just a handful will grow 100 fold or more. Just one is required to change your life. Nexus is built to find it. Had it existed at the time, Nexus would have pinpointed stocks like Monster, Sleep Number and Biospecifics all ahead of a minimum 100 fold growth. This is a low volume product for serious long term investors. Register now via the link in the show notes or visit mywallstreet.com forward slash Nexus to express your interest. James, I've been a fan of dividend aristocrats ETF for so many years. It's probably it brings together the two things that I don't generally participate in, which is ETFs and dividend paying businesses. Do you have a view on that ETF? Yeah, no, nothing wrong with it. I mean, it, it's probably a perfectly. I don't know what the fee is. I mean, you look for the fees for these things, but but I think it's a perfectly fine way to to get into dividends if you're not 
a dividend guy, you know, someone who wants to, to dig into the weeds and, and, and find your own stocks. I mean, what I would do is, uh, you know, I generally find the most broad reaching, uh, low cost uh, ETF, and, you know, for, for whatever I'm trying to buy and, and buy that. So I'm, I'm sure mm-hmm. there are competitors. But, you know, for me, for ETFs, I mean, I, I mostly just do broad market ETFs. James, I know you're passionate about healthcare and that you serve on a couple of boards in that area. Are there any publicly listed healthcare companies that you believe have something special that's very difficult to replicate? Uh, that's a good question. You're basically asking about a moat. Um, in, in so many ways, in it, I'll be honest, I've avoided a lot of the larger healthcare companies. I mean, I hold Johnson & Johnson, but... Uh, because I, I don't think they have that much of a moat that's impossible to replicate. But at the same time, they, they, they kind of do have something that they all, as an oligopoly, they have distribution. If we're talking about the bigger ones like, you know, Merck, Pfizer, you know, those guys, uh, you know, they have distribution. And the, 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 the drug business particularly, and I know healthcare has many different segments, uh, but mm-hmm. the, the drug business, uh, it, it's almost become like the movie business in the sense that it's sort of like a blockbuster or bust model. Like you got to be big or, or, or just go home. And the big companies have sort of run aground in terms of the chemical based uh, drug discovery, a small molecule drug discovery uh, method. So they just sit there and say, hey, look, we're big, we're huge. We have deals with everybody. We have distribution let's just wait for these little biotechs to take the risk and do the innovation. And most are going to flame out and that's okay, but we don't care. And when we get big, when they get big enough, you know, maybe past phase three, you know, we'll just go in and buy them and then, and then Mm -hmm. plug them into our network. So that's been working well, even if they don't really have like some massive advantage uh, per se that nobody else could do, like they still do that. So they still have that advantage. So I would say investing in, in, in those is more of a matter of saying, okay, what does the patent cliff look like for each company? But uh, you know, Honestly, any of these big companies could be the one to go in and buy any particular biotech. Now, some of them specialize more in oncology. Some of them specialize more in, you know, uh, uh, immune issues, whatever. But uh, I think they're less differentiated than than the average person may think. They're just big companies with cash and distribution that buy these smaller companies to add in. Can you foresee a business kind of toppling one of the giants of medic? Hey, I always get it confused. You're asking about Amazon healthcare kind of a thing, right? Oh yeah. So Medicare, I suppose the the the, the OG is um, United Healthcare. Are they the biggest? Yeah, yeah, they the they're the big one. In the space. Yep. So can you see like someone like Clover or Clover, one of these small pretenders, actually managing to take a reasonable bite? at one of these giants? Probably not in the next five years, but but mm. I will tell you, I'm, I'm secretly like desperately hoping for that because Emmett, as you probably know, healthcare is 18, sometimes 19% of US GDP. Uh, it, it's rather obscene. And, and part unreal. of that, part of that is because we we encourage innovation here, and so if you've got the, some hot new drug, you're going to come here, and you know it costs a fortune in the beginning, that eventually gets cheaper, right? So that's kind of the okay part, at least the part I'm okay with. But we've also got all these middlemen, like these pharmacy benefit managers, that that claim they add value into the system. When I would argue they they do the opposite, they extract value. Mm-hmm. It's rent seeking in an economic sense. You come in and you kind of stake your claim, and you try to like put barriers up to, that, that, that protect or prevent people from taking some of your profits, right? Not because you're so good, just because you're kind of like kind of like race car driver slowing down to, to stall the guy behind him, being difficult to pass instead of trying to win the race by going fast, right? Uh, yeah, there's a yeah. lot of that, a lot of that wow. in the healthcare sector. So I would love to see it disrupted. It's an incredibly complex area. And the more I learn about it, the more I invest in it, the more I read in it, the more I realize how little I know about it. It's like this giant ball of string. And it's so hard to partic- to find a particular niche or area that is actually like primed to prosper because of the very behavior that you described there. But if we if we widen the net a little beyond healthcare, are there any sectors or industries that you're kind of excited about right now that you think, yeah, I'm very happy about where this industry is positioned for the year, three, five, 10 years ahead. Well, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll go not too far from those big health healthcare companies and go to biotech in it because there are, I mean, biotech, biotech has been killed lately because interest rates mostly. Interest rates went up. Uh, those companies that didn't have cash flows in the here and now went down, including a lot of biotech companies. There are, I think, about 840 publicly traded biotech companies, at least you know as of a few months ago. But the FDA in the US only approves about 40 drugs per year. And mm. it's just completely unrealistic to have so many companies vying for, for those 40 slots. It's just way more than... than 
is sustainable. Uh, but in general, the global dynamics, the population, uh, the, the wealth uh, uh, accumulation in the world is positive for biotech. So I think we're going to have a great washout. I'm not yet excited about biotech. But I feel like I will be soon. We're still seeing companies trading for, you know, cash, sometimes less than cash, you know, the, the really bad ones. But, you know, this is the natural evolution. We need to let this washout happen. Let most of those companies die. I mean, that's how that's how all industries work. Right. There's a boom. You have all these people come up and then and then almost everything. I mean, the U.S. and there have been over 2000 car companies and they've mm. come and gone. Now we've just got a wow. couple. Right. There were there were 900 e-commerce companies in the 1990s. And, and at least a couple of years ago, I think there were 40,000 different crypto coins. And I don't know what the number there are now, but that's the way things work. There's a whole mm. bunch in the beginning and then almost all of them die, leaving just a handful. So yeah. it's not yet the time to go jumping into biotech, but uh, it, it will be soon, I believe. This is a really unfair question. And if you don't know, just say, I don't know. But the next door neighbor of biotech is CRISPR. Have you had a look at that as a technology or an investable? Yeah, I, I own a little bit of the CRISPR therapeutics. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. look, this stuff is highly, highly, highly risky. Um, and, and there are ethical concerns, too, that, that have not yet been, been ironed out. But, but basically, it's a punt. I mean, Nobody knows. Nobody knows uh, what what the gene editing is is going to look like in in five or ten years. But we do know that if it works, it'll it'll work big. So that's one of those like tiny little positions. And at some point, it's it's been the biggest gainer in my portfolio. It's been the biggest loser in my portfolio. I mean, it it moves a lot. Yeah, yeah. So in the, in the general sphere of technology and staying in the conversation, how do you think technology? and competitiveness affect investing. So just as Warren Buffett had to modify Benjamin Graham's approach, uh, Buffett's approach has already seen, you could argue, seen his best days, and he's inspired legions and millions of copycats. So what captures, some of what he captures are timeless, good business principles, but how do we invest when so many others are doing it similarly? And now we're aided by breakthrough technologies like AI. Yeah, so so true. You know, um, I, I've been to Berkshire Hathaway not not a long, long time, but since 2018, I've I've gone to every meeting, and the secret is out, right? I mean, the cat's out of the bag. Everybody knows how well Buffett has done, uh, phenomenal returns in that company, and and he's uh, rightfully rightfully just created this this legion of of imitators and people following mm -hmm. him. And now with with AI with, with tech, I mean, even even analysts at, when I was still at Motley Fool, you just see how much faster they are with the technology, at least than I was. And I'm I'm just Gen X. I'm not that old yet, but uh, you know, with AI now, they're going to be able to to implement Buffett esque strategies super quickly. So this idea of, of finding these diamonds in the rough, I mean, Ben Graham had net nets, right? And, and, and Buffett you know, couldn't find any more of those. So he kind of went to these high quality long-term businesses. I think, I, I think overall, the, 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 the idea of patience will never go out of style. Like that mm. quote I gave earlier, that stat about 2021, having more money flowing into the market than in the prior 19 years, that still shows a lot. So I, I feel like, even though there are a lot of these Buffett uh, wannabes that, that probably jump in, like if you find some really good small company run by a nice management team. And by the way, people are, are catering to that audience, too, just like we mentioned how people cater to dividend investors and try to put on a bit of a show, sometimes rightly, sometimes wrongly. People do the same thing to the Warren Buffett crowd. Sometimes you'll see these financial statements presented in kind of a Buffetty way or the company comes across in this, you know, Oh shucks, you know, avuncular sort of uh, uh, fashion because they know people out there are are trying to to invest in that Buffett style, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. I would say that's a good thing. He's really done a tremendous uh, uh, service to global capitalism, to global in investing overall. So it's it's good for people to copy Buffett, but I, I don't think you're going to be able to find as many just you know turn over the stone and here's a great company anymore mm, uh that's yeah. that's going to be harder so yeah nothing wrong with index investing and then people are just going to have fewer pick pick your individual stocks uh more carefully at least that's what mm. i'm doing yeah you touched on your gen x i always get confused who's gen x y and z but i know i think gen z are the the, the youngest group isn't that right yeah, They're under under twenty six, I think. Right. Okay. So, is it is it realistic? I mean, just again, shifting gears here, but is it realistic that Gen Z's expectation for working in, or rather, working for and investing in companies that are aligning with their values is that a realistic kind of um, a realistic 
premise in which you can live your life, that you only want to work and invest in companies doing good? Or do you think that people need to park something, some of their, let's say, moral values in order to kind of progress? Well, you know, I, I actually wrote a force piece about this when I got back from the Berkshire Hathaway meeting, because it, it, it struck me that there's clearly a tribe around Berkshire Hathaway. And that tribe is yeah. based on sort of, you know, uh, companies doing well, kind of this do-gooder ethics, companies, you know, sh shareholder primacy. In other words, the, the shareholder primacy notion is, is, is the one that, that says companies need to do its best for their shareholders. And that's largely been what's prevailed for the past, you know, 50, 100 years. But there are a lot of, of younger people, millennials too, and Gen Z says, hey, you know, I, I want to find good companies doing good things. And, and there's a tremendous amount of goodwill. And guess what? I'm, I'm kind of like that too, right? I mean, I would, I, I used to be vegetarian for, for six and a half years. I do eat meat now, but I only humanely means raised meat, like whole foods kind of meat or hunted meat. You know, I, I don't believe like McDonald's uh, kind of feedlot cattle is uh, ethical. So I'm, I'm cautious about that uh, with my consumerism, but with with getting into investing, how realistic is it? I think is a question. Um, I think it's, that's challenging because the the, the mm. global ninety percent of Gen Zs say they either want to work for or invest in companies that align with their values. So I think the intention is good, but the global economy is kind of like a water balloon. You squeeze one part of it, and the other part bulges out, right? So you say, you know, I, I don't want to be, um, you know, buying oil. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to burn oil, uh, so you know I'm gonna I'm gonna you know you know do X Y Z right. Well, guess what? I mean, someone else is gonna is gonna take advantage of that low lower oil price. Or I don't want to, in the old days when there were conflict diamonds. I think it's been cleaned up a lot, but you know you might uh, eschew De Beers, right? But actually, most of the conflict diamonds go into electronics. Like seventy to eighty percent of them go into electronics that you probably certainly have used. Mm -hmm. So I didn't much, know that. Yeah, it's much harder to, and I'm saying this as somebody who, who wants to make the world better. Uh, ESG yeah. investing is, I mean, it's taken a lot of heat in the past couple of years. And, and we're not mm. talking about just that with the millennial question, but I think that's a large part of it um, because there's there's a lot of hypocrisy. Like the EU, I think, um, Committee on Sustainability and I think Citigroup used to hate guns, right? Guns are bad. Everybody knows we avoid guns. But then after Russia invaded Ukraine, suddenly, well, maybe defense companies are are better, right? Guns are okay when they're defending us. Um, or, you know, Tesla gets kicked out of the S&P 500 ESG index while Exxon Mobil remains, right? Um, it's very, <laughs> there, there's a lot of hypocrisy. There's a lot of well, well-meaning intentions too. But we found out, I think correctly over the past couple of years that this stuff is just much more of a tangled web uh, than, than we thought. And as far as working for a company or investing in a company that aligns with your values, uh, I think that could be done to a limited extent, certainly working, you want a good company culture. But uh, if we, we start talking about taking stances on issues uh, aside from the company's core scope of business, like if you're a coffee company and somebody wants you to take a stance on abortion, uh, you know, I think that's just not in the cards. I don't think it makes sense. Uh, you know, and, and then what do we end up having? A world where there's you know, the, the pro-abortion coffee company, and then there's the anti-abortion coffee company. And, and we've got this kind of like hodgepodge or, or barnacle style system of, of causes stacked on top of each other. And I don't think it works. James, this, I presume, has been your pursuit of stock investing for something between 20 and 30 years. Is that fair to say? Uh, it has. Yeah, about 25 years. Right. Now, yeah. OK, so we're, we're probably in and around the same age, despite the fact that you look 10 years younger than me. Well done. I wish. I wish. Everyone, everyone does. But anyway. you haven't seen the top of my hair. Yeah, but... <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> so the so over those 25 years, you've obviously read some books that have inspired you. You've encountered resources that you just couldn't do without. Can you just tell me and our listeners, what are your favorite books? What are your favorite resources as a stock investor? Okay, I'm going to go with resources because believe it or not, and this is almost like a thing now, I've never read an investing book in my life. Uh, I, I've read many textbooks about investing or, or you know, looked at pieces here and there, equity valuation, derivative stuff. Well, you're you're a CFA, right? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. So, so I, I mean, I, I, you know, I could probably pass level one, I would say, but I, I, don't, you know, I don't know about the rest, but um. I mean, I, I taught equity valuation for many years at Motley Fool. You know, I, I built all my models. I built, uh, I used to do stat arb at, at, at a hedge fund years ago. And in fact, global arb, like before it got banned, you could you could arbitrage different time zones. So I built I built a lot of models in my day, but it's always been like, okay, I need mm. to know this. Let me dig the here. I need to know this. Let me yeah. dig here. But I would say I've absorbed, yeah. I've read a bazillion articles about yes. not everything, right? Yeah. So I've absorbed And, and you've written a bazillion as well. And I've, I've read written too many, those. too many. <laughs> but in terms of re resources, 
the first thing I would mention is uh, Professor Otswas de Mordoran's content. He is a, a fantastic guy. He's a professor at NYU. And despite being a finance professor, he really doesn't care about money. I've had the privilege of, of meeting him. Uh, he came to Motley Fool at, at our invitation. Uh, very kind guy. He puts all of his stuff up for free, which years ago was a really big deal. It angered his publishers. He, he had his classes on the internet. And uh, I, I watched and I, I just absorbed it hook, line and sinker. And that taught me how to think about investing. It's not really that complicated. And most people do, do it the wrong way. You know, they, they try to look by example first, like here's this company in the news, here's this company. They, that's good. That part comes a little bit later. I would say you want to get a good grasp on the first principles first. Otherwise, you're going to be just in this blur of noise uh, and, and it's very hard to 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 figure out what really matters and what doesn't. So uh, Oswath de Mordoran has all, I think still probably up there for free, uh, my, mm. my first recommendation. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, hit me with another one, James. Uh, I would say the Warren Buffett annual letters. Uh, that's, I mean, not a book, but actually they have been put into a book by, by, by Larry Cunningham, a really a friend of mine, sort of a, a very nice guy. Um, they, they have, that's kind of going from the opposite side uh, of the mortar and whereas he's much more technical, here's how things should work algebraically, you know, Buffett kind of puts it into this kind of pithy, uh, you know, he's kind of the Aesop's fables guy of the investing world. And if you're just starting out, that's another great way to absorb it from someone who's obviously proven to be an outlier, proven to be successful. Whereas DeMortner is more algebraic in his approach. Buffett is more like, well, kind of here's how the world really works. I think that's another first principles way coming from the opposite direction. James, I usually finish out interviews with guests that, uh, like yourself with a simple <clears throat> question, which is if you could only buy and hold a handful of stocks, what would you choose? So I'm going to take that question and modify it slightly because I understand your investment uh, thesis or your investment profile at this stage. So if you could only buy one high risk, one mid risk and one low risk stock and hold the, that three stock portfolio for the rest of your life, which ones would you choose and why? Okay. Um, all right. So, so I'll, I'll brainstorm a little bit here and try to nail it down to one. So, so low risk, I don't know if Berkshire Hathaway is low risk, but, but I, mm -hmm. I, I like it. It's probably slightly better than the S and P kind of a stock in the long run. I mean, obviously Buffett mm -hmm. and Munger aren't going to live forever, but he, they've got great lieutenants and Apple, which is not one of their initial picks. It probably made more money. I think it has made more money for Berkshire than any other, any other investment. So uh, Berkshire Hathaway is one option. Uh, Next Era Energy, NEE -E is the ticker. This is the former Florida Power and Light. Uh, FPL used to be kind of a bad guy company uh, that w with not a good reputation, but they've really since embraced uh, the, the shift the world is making to cleaner, greener energy. And uh, as a bonus, at least in the southeastern U.S., the regulatory, regulatory environment is very friendly. Uh, utilities live or die based on their relationships with the regulators. So if the regulator says, okay, you're allowed to earn this much, then great. If not, if not. So in certain places like Illinois, California, Massachusetts, the regulators tend to be kind of adversarial, but in the Southern US, they tend to be, be less so. So that's one of those two would be my low risk stock. Uh, maybe maybe uh, NEE if, if uh, Berkshire Hathaway is not quite low risk. Uh, if we go to mid risk, um, probably Diageo. Diageo is one of my no thesis kind of stocks. I mean, what do they do? They make booze. Very simple. Mm -hmm. and they've been doing it forever. This was a, a, a longtime pick of mine in my income investor newsletter at Motley Fool, and it did very, very well. Alcohol consumption is growing faster than global GDP, something like 10% or just over that per year for the next 10 years, according to some estimates. Uh, Diageo has, a, I think, about a, just a little under 5% market share, about 4.7%. They're targeting 6% total market share in alcohol by 2030. And the super premium brands, the cheesy name, super premium, right? But that's what they call it. <laughs> the, the expensive booze is, is more valuable as a status symbol, as the world- And they make you know, Guinness. I mean, you can't argue yeah, with that. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, but but if you know if you go to China, if you go to India, if you go to these uh, emerging or, or developing markets that are probably a little bit past that now, uh, one of the first things they do is start spending on expensive liquor, expensive alcohol a as gifts. So long term, I like the dynamics for Diageo, and I said as a non drinker, as a teetotaler, mm. um, high risk. One... Hold on, can I click pause? Let me click yeah, pause sure. on that for a minute. So Diageo, I always regard Constellation as a major competitor of theirs. They do, uh, I think, Corona and a couple of other big brands. But I saw a couple of years ago, they invested very, very heavily in the um, CBD uh, industry. 
do you think that's now this is a very niche question but do you think cbd and all these kind of related products is a flash in the pan or a real industry that is going to i suppose run in parallel with alcohol i, I think it's a small I, I mean first of all I, i'm biased okay like i i've yeah. never taken any drugs i've never smoked mm -hmm. a cigarette in my life i mean it's just not yeah, my, my thing um so so i i, I hate it and i i, I don't mm -hmm. like the idea i mean the, the oil itself i mean you're putting on your elbow whatever sure no problem okay but i don't mm -hmm. like yeah. I, so i should specify i don't like re, you know recreational or uh, marijuana i mean maybe medicinal marijuana yeah. but um I, I think the industry we're, we're finding now, it, it's been kind of a joke. I mean, it, there is something there, but what's the there there is much, much smaller than, than people mm. were expecting. Uh, nowhere near justifies the hype. I mean, the, the, the CBD products are probably the better buy, uh, the, the better, the more legitimate sell. I think the, the I don't know, I'm, I'm going off the question a little bit, but I think the, mm. the actual marijuana to get high, it just has such a strong competition from the illegal market that 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 industry is really really suffering so uh probably not the best move by you know by these guys in the long run yeah I tend to agree it's funny because diageo just stuck with the knitting and uh, and as you said the market the global market is still growing where constellations seem to just kind of spin off and and lose that that uh, strategic focus and and that's why i raise it because i am a big fan of diageo as well and i've been looking at next era okay hit me with your small or rather uh, your kind of high risk the high risk high yeah so, so if it's hold forever i would not go biotech those are too risky um mm. a weird one might be disney uh it's you know they've taken a beating the, the stock price just just killed uh they've got uh, activists now at the door who backed off when Bob Iger, the, the old CEO, became the new CEO again. Uh, I think there's still something about those brands. And the, the company may be split up into multiple pieces. People, if, if you if you Google Disney split up, something like that, you'll find every year there's a bunch of these people revisit the same question. It's never happened, but it may still happen. But having had a, a son, Emmett, toys these days are not about toys like when we were growing up you know you play with the ball it's all about branded stuff you're at the, the elmo backpack or the elmo mm -hmm. uh football the, the you know the the disney princess basketball or, or the scooter whatever it is so they've got they've got lots of valuable ip that in some way shape or form is going to be very enduring if they can find out how to package it right they're, they're not doing a great job now they're probably doing the right thing to invest more in their parks which they're doing uh they just announced a, a doubling of investment in their theme park so they've got some struggles you know they may spin off espn obviously the the uh linear tv business is, is not good right now but disney's one option another thing that i'll throw out which is certainly not a a lifer kind of investment, but just something interesting. And this comes courtesy of BBAE CEO, Barry Freeman. He was looking at this is, is an airline company called Delta. Usually I don't like airlines, but yeah. Delta has this credit card business, the mileage business called Sky Miles, which is basically outsourced. But just to give you some uh, proportions here, the company makes about $56 billion a year in revenue, about 7 billion in EBITDA. But the Sky Mile business, 6 billion in revenue. So just a tiny little bit of that 56 billion in revenue but it's half or just about half of the EBITDA. So on, on a, you know, in terms of punching well above its weight, I mean, it's, it's just, it's very impressive. And it's a spinoff candidate at some point, it, wow. because right now its value is likely being depressed by virtue of forcibly being bundled in with, with an airline. And we all know airlines have been, at least in the mm. U.S., the most difficult businesses to operate. You know, we've got unions, mm. we've got high fixed costs, and especially in the U.S., because union labor, I mean, the, the labor is 30 to 40 percent of the airline's uh, uh, revenues. In, mm. in South America, for example, it might be 12 percent or 15 percent, much, much, much less, right? Because, you know, they, they hire younger people. And when you're you know, mid thirties, then, you know, get out of there. Right. Uh, I'm not saying that's good, but it keeps their labor costs down. Whereas in the U S we've got very expensive unions. So Delta could be an interesting, uh, spinoff candidate. Very interesting. I flew Delta last week out of Denver, which I think is kind of their HQ or their home airport. And, um, yeah, I was surprised frankly, that the plane could still fly. It was a 1970 <laughs> something Boeing. I think I have to hand it to you, James, you're probably the only person I have ever met who would qualify Disney and Delta as high risk picks. <laughs> <laughs> if you and I spent a week together in the same office, it would be lit literally like cold fusion would happen. I don't know how it would go. So um, that's great. So we're talking next era, Berkshire is kind of neck and neck, uh, Diageo, Disney and Delta, because it has its own little version of the iPhone with this, uh, with this 
financial product that you said, which is going to creep up on its revenue lines. James, it's been an absolute pleasure to interview, interview you on Stock Club, and I hope I can entice you back another day for us to talk other high-risk stocks like, I don't know, uh, Johnson & Johnson and, and the likes. <laughs> Anytime, Emmett, I'm happy. But all the, the high risk you want, of course. <laughs> <laughs> See you soon, James, and thank you. Uh, before we finish up the show, I just want to give a quick word to our friends and sponsors at Vodafone Business. Uh, they recently launched their VHub Digital Advisory Service, offering Irish businesses of all sizes free one-to-one -one digital support and advice. You don't even have to be a Vodafone Business customer to avail of this service. Just search Vodafone VHub to book a call with one of their digital experts, and we will leave a link in the show notes for today's episode. Mm -hmm.